time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has told investors in Paris, France, that Nigeria is ready to welcome investment and do business with them. Tinubu expressed Nigeria's readiness to welcome investors into the country when he received the president and chairman of the board of directors of African Export Import Bank, Afrexim Bank, Professor Benedict Orama, and the president of the European Bank for Con Reconstruction and Development, Odile Renaud Basso, on the sidelines of the Summit for New Global Financing. A presidency statement quotes President Tinubu as also saying that the ongoing reforms in Nigeria, starting with the fuel subsidy removal and streamlining of the exchange rate, will be sustained for a more competitive economy that attracts foreign direct investments while urging investors to take advantage of opportunities in Nigeria. Also, the Nigerian government has denied reports of approval made for salary review of political office holders and judicial officers. A statement by the Special Advisor on Special Duties, Communications and Strategy to the President, Dele Alake, says while the presidency recognizes that it is within the constitutional remit of the Revenue Mobilization, Allocation and Fiscal Commission to propose and fix salaries and allowances of political office holders and judicial officers, such cannot come to effect until it has equally been considered and approved by the president. He alleged that the narrative was, and I quote, contrived to create ill will for the new administration, end of quote. Bufai. I mean, a lot has to be said. At first, I'd like to <clears throat> talk about President Buhari's trip to France and what he's doing. Uh, I mean, President Tinubu, beg your pardon. I mean, it gets, it's just getting used to just a fraudulent sleep. Uh, President Tinubu's trip to, to France and the economy and opening up Africa, the truth has to be said. I'm really excited about the quality of conversations and I'm happy about the people he's met on the sidelines. Recently, the DMO talked about the need to be able to raise a lot of revenue. In fact, they put a cap of about 15 trillion. Currently, we're doing in the region of about 10 trillion. But Nigeria has potential for way more. Nigeria can do knock on wood about 30, 40, even 50 trillion when we harness the resource. It's quite a large country, blessed with natural resources, but also blessed with people with intellectual capacity. So what can we do to be able to unlock these sectors? And that has always been the plague of Africa. So much opportunity, but less way of harnessing them. A couple of quick wins for me will be number one, solid mineral. There's a lot of wealth built taken away and being frittered away in solid mineral that once we harmonize, there's a whole lot that can be done. Also, gas. Nigeria is a gas country. We've heard stories of people trying to prospect for crude oil and they dig up the well and gas comes up and they shut down the well. If we can harness that with the rich resource of the people across many sectors, the automotive sectors, for instance, and because the problem bedeviling in Africa is the fact that we've not been able to catalyze leadership to bring out the best of our people to jumpstart our economy. I was in Abidjan recently at the Africa CEO's Forum, and the conversation was how can we go from 300 to 3,000? What it meant was that with Europe, Europe has companies with revenue base of over 1 billion USD, 3,000 of them. Africa has 300, 400, less than 400. And I can tell you for free, with our currency situation now, that prospect is going to drop. Because most Nigerian companies will have been pushed up that one trillion revenue mark, even your top big Nigerian conglomerates. But we have a lot of resource. We have a lot of wealth. So how can we do this in partnership with Afrexim, for instance, building a symbiotic relationship with the development banks and catalyzing the sector, and also with the use of internal private capital to be able to jumpstart the African economy. And that's the greatest challenge Nigeria will have and President Tinubu will have. And I'm happy about conferences like this that are well on their way because there's a need for it. In fact, I, I got an invitation recently, but I can't make it, to a conference of that nature in Senegal, where Senegal is saying, come invest in Senegal because we need to be able to attract people to the economy. Knock on wood, President Tubu might not bring in that revenue now because of this conference, but definitely will establish relationship that will be able to help him in the long run. 
So we wish him a lot of well as regards the conversation. And there are many sectors, climate change, readiness, and things like that, because the ecosystem of the world is changing. The second story, I think we had talked about that ad nauseum here. Yeah. We had talked about the fact that it was a recommendation. But yeah, there was a story that some newspaper did report, but Arise did not report that. We didn't report that the president had approved. We reported there was a recommendation. And in fact, we had somebody from RAMFAC, like I like to call them. I think I'm the only one that calls them that acronym, Revenue Mobilization, come on television to defend the need for it. And some of the argument they made was that it's not been reviewed in 16 years, that the president's salary is one of the lowest in the world and all of those arguments, which a lot of Nigerians have pushed back on. So Mr. Daly Alake releasing this out, definitely will be able to tackle those that said it was an approval, but nobody said there was an approval prior to this time, if you listen to the analysis. But I believe strongly that we can push the frontiers on economic development in Nigeria. Yeah. Well, we made a point very clearly yesterday that it was a recommendation. Yeah. Nobody said that President Tinubu has approved it. Because I saw a story online in which we were being quoted out of context, saying that on the morning show we said that President Tinubu has approved it. We never said so. What we said is that, look, in line with the relevant laws, RMFC, third schedule of the, uh, uh, part one of the third schedule of the Constitution, section 84, section 124, we still have to process this through the National Assembly, right? So it's at best a, a recommendation. For the federal government and the FCT, it has to go through the National Assembly. For the states, it has to go through states and local governments, it has to go through state houses of assembly. So it's not as if the RMAFC can pronounce it into existence. But we said even if it goes through that process, the president should not approve it for reasons that were properly outlined yesterday. The people bringing up the story that we said President uh, uh, Tinumbu has approved, this is a kind of mischief, you know. A lot of people have hearing problems, I imagine. Oh, yes. <laughs> so you know, when you say things on television, they just twist it for their own uh, convenient purposes. But in any case, we dealt with that yesterday. Uh, the uh, trip to, uh, uh, to Paris, uh, you know, that summit has been attended by about 50 leaders from around the world, including the private sector, including civil society, and it's hosted by uh, uh, President Macron of, of France. So, you know, it's a multi-stakeholder meeting. And I think that in terms of the theme, excellent theme, talking about a new architecture for the global financial park. We've been on that subject internationally since 1974, when there was talk about a new uh, international economic order. That's the context of it. And in terms of theme, this particular conference is talking about how the developed world you know, can help developing countries, uh, you know, issues of debt, issues of poverty, issues of uh, climate change, and a global development process uh, that will have developing countries at the center. And for President Tinubu, I think it's so far a very good outing. Uh, this is his first major uh, trip, uh, international trip, as uh, president of Nigeria. And so far, you know, the outing has been good for him. He's met with a number of uh, uh, development uh, partners. Benedict Orama, uh, Professor Orama of the African Bank, uh, met with him yesterday. The president of the uh, of the ERBD, the European Bank for for Reconstruction and Development, also met with them. And the president's message is simply this: Look, we are ready in Nigeria. Come and join us as a, and make Nigeria a major stakeholder. If you don't, you know, focus on Nigeria, you may be missing out on the vast opportunities available in Nigeria. The president, of course is the country's uh, number one foreign policy uh, uh, diplomat. He's also the country's number one salesman. And you know, he's so far been doing in France a good uh, salesmanship job, selling Nigeria to the world. And he, said, he has preached this on the uh, foundation of recent economic policies taken in Nigeria. He talked about the removal of subsidy. He talked about the harmonization of uh, you know, the foreign exchange regime. And he, he, you know, he's telling the whole world that, look, there are opportunities in Nigeria. Indeed, there are opportunities in Nigeria, uh, you know, enormous uh, opportunities. Now, secondly, President uh, Macron, in welcoming people, again, stressed the importance of the uh, summit. But I took special notice of the contribution by, uh, uh, by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, 
uh, Mr. Guterres uh, was saying that, look, the world needs to do more for African countries. African countries, according to him, are not properly centered within the global order, and which is part of the whole point, you know, about the new uh, international economic uh, order. And uh, Mr. Guterres was saying, we need to address issues of fragmentation, uh, you know, divisions in the world, debt relief, suspension of debt payments, you know, change of uh, approach in a way that will be to the advantage of the uh, developing countries. But for me, one major point that was made by President Macron is respect for state sovereignty. Because when these developing countries go to the uh, West or they talk about the imbalance between North and South, okay, they take these debts, but state sovereignty is important. You know, um, following up with the required expertise is important. Equity is important within the international order. All of this said, however, I started by saying that it's been a good outing for Nigeria and personally for President uh, uh, Bola Ahmed Chinubu. But the mission point in Nigeria has always been follow up. All these commitments that we get, one thing Shall that President up, yeah. Bola Chinubu should do and prioritize is follow up. Because in most cases, Nigeria goes to all these international engagements. We make commitments, but we don't always follow up. We expect to see significant difference under the watch of President Bola Ahmed Chinubu. Absolutely. The uh, president has started on a great note in terms of um, positioning, in terms of um, interactions, and his selling, if I could put it that way, of Nigeria as a, an attractive destination for foreign um, direct investment. I think I must highlight some of the areas which they talked about, which is financing healthcare, infrastructure, and also looking at our SME, that's small and medium um, enterprises. Very important because we have seen potential in these sectors. Unfortunately, policies and um, political will has, no, has not developed that sector in the way that it ought to. Um, also, I'm proud of the fact that the president said rightly that Nigeria as an economy is too big to be ignored by the international world. And it is evidenced by the interest, whether you like it or not, and you know, in terms of what we have faced economically and security-wise in terms of the state of the nation, you would see that there has still been a keen interest from the foreign world in Nigeria. Only this week we talked about uh, Bill Gates' visit to the country. He's interested when he um, came here in partnering with Nigeria in terms, of, particularly in the area of healthcare and addressing healthcare challenges. These are the kind of visits uh, that we hope to attract as a nation, and it depends largely on number one, the, on leadership, body language, on policy reforms, as was highlighted in Paris yesterday. And it is important that the president has, on, you know, in his tenure, started on that note. Now, I just wanted to highlight as well yesterday, going to the second story, um, Dr. Bati, that you had actually, I remember very clearly, detailed this, and it's, the record is on there, that we spoke uh, to the subject with regards to the RMAFC um, announcement and the fact that he still had to go through a process. And in saying that, the report or the um, statement released by Mr. Delia Lake, who is the president's spokesperson, um, the line in terms of engaging with the media, it is important to highlight that sometimes the spokesperson of the president can almost sound combative when indeed he's supposed to be working with the media and informing Nigerians. You will get um, this information, but it's always not to misalign your government. I think it, in terms of starting on that note, Campaign season is over. It's a new slate. It's a new government. Let's work together in terms of building this nation. Moving on to other stories, the Nigeria Labour Congress has condemned a proposed 40% hike in electricity tariff as insensitive and callous. The Labour Union says life in Nigeria could become much more difficult due to a barrage on price hikes, including fees in tertiary institutions. In a statement, NLC President Joe Ajaro urges the federal government to halt the proposed tariff hike for the collective safety of the masses. The NLC argues that there have been increases without notice in violation of statutes. In, this, in the tariff order, multi-year tariff order, they had three assumptions, you know, to consider in the uh, increase in tariff or its adjustment, as they may uh, like to use. Uh, that, that is what they call upward up, adjustment. Uh, to that extent, they looked at the issue of uh, inflation. They looked at the issue of the devaluation of the currency. 
And then those are some of the assumptions they looked at to increase, you know, tariff. And you look at a, whenever inflation goes high, they increase tariff. Increase in tariff equally creates inflation. And then it became a, a, a vicious circle that continues to grow from time to time, you know, which happened to be a very wrong one. If they increase it now, even with the increase in the uh, pump price of petroleum products, and then you increase tariff again, there will be another inflation, which they will turn back to claim that there is inflation. Meanwhile, their increase, you know, had equally led to increase in tariff, you know. So it, 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 that is a wrong way of deciding the mode or the model or the option to be adopted in uh, adjustment of tariff. You know, I think it can, it's not sustainable because this will not be the end. If the prices of commodity in the market skyrockets again, you know, they will adjust tariff again. If it comes down, they are not, apart from once, they just played on our psyche that they reduce tariff. They don't bring tariff down. And this will just lead to nowhere. Well, the federal government uh, allusion that they are spending 50 billion, I'm not here to doubt it, but I'm here to say that electricity, especially the discos, have been privatized you know, to the private sector. So what is government doing in another person's business? Because the mantra they have been proposing is that government has no business in business. So why are they subsidizing Mr. J. Rowe and Mr. John's business? So it is laughable and it's so, so scandalous if after privatization of electricity and handing it over to the private sector and the federal government say they are subsidizing it. That wasn't the impression we were giving. We were giving the impression that government had no money, you know, that the private sector had a, lo a lot of money, you know, to handle electricity, electricity distribution, generation, and transmission. And they sold it to individuals. So why are they spending 50 billion monthly? I don't understand the calculation. Well, the assumption they gave to uh, Nigerians before privatization, because I was at the head of it as the general secretary of the National Union of Electricity Police for over 10 years, we tried to explain to them that for a, an underdeveloping country, you know, you don't come up with privatization. For a country where there is no availability, for a country where there is no accessibility, for a country where you can't situate affordability, that Nigeria was not ripe for privatization. But some of them decided to go ahead with it. NLC President uh, Joe, Comrade Joe Ajaro mm. there, Rufai, speaking to the electricity I mean, um, hike. I mean, I, he, so there are many parts of this argument. It's a very variegated argument. And it speaks to a lot of things as regards, you know, uh, mitre rate benchmarks to inflationary uh, tendencies. There's constantly been a talk about cost-reflective tariff. And the reason why a lot of key international energy companies don't want to come into our country because they don't want to touch it because of the fact that it's still pretty much regulated and there's still subsidies in energy which 50 billion has been expended every month to be able to cushion the effect of people. Because if you have cost-reflective tariff like it's had in other parts of Africa, like Senegal and the likes, then it becomes more expensive. And I get the point of Mr. Joe Ajiro because it's coming at a time that you just remove fuel subsidy. That has already increased inflationary pressures. And now you are going to remove this also, with jack up the inflationary pressure. So it's going to be a double whammy or a triple whammy for a lot of problems for a lot of Nigerians. But there's also the other part of the argument that says actually, at some point, you really need to liberalize the sector, have cost-reflective tariffs so that the sector can run independently on its own and all of that. I think the understanding should be base cost and modeling, really. And, you know, sometimes you will have thought that this, the, the model that worked for telecoms will work for all as regards to utilities and things like this. But it's always very difficult. But I get his concern. And I think Labour should still look at this with federal government and uh, let's see how we can have safe lines and see halfway. But also when you look at the stretch of the argument, the stretch of the argument is that even with the increase in tariff, we're not producing enough and people are not even getting the electricity. So that's even the bone of contention in the first place. Uh, despite the fact that, yes, you have power plants here and there, you had into the grid, but people are not getting enough. I'm not sure, knock on wood, we've had 6,000 megawatts in the grid in recent times, about 5,000 threshold. So I get his argument, but also, 
these are the parts of the structural frameworks we need to work on for the long-term development of this country. And yeah, we're well on our way, but we also need to do it systematically, not to hurt people too much. All of a sudden, you cannot change the system that has been largely government helping the people yeah. to a capitalist system without having pushbacks. Yeah. Well, I, I think the key point that uh, Joe Ajero made is the effect on the poor. Yeah. Um, electricity tariffs will more or less go up because the uh, discos are already saying the cost of everything has gone up. And that the best thing that they've always been arguing from their own perspective has been cost-reflective tariffs. But the main argument is this. Fuel subsidy is gone. Diesel now attracts a VAT of 7.54%. Education subsidy is most likely on its way out. And then on top of this, again, electricity tariff hike as proposed, 40% with effect from July 1. I mean, <laughs> look, it's like we, the ordinary people of Nigeria, are beginning to suffocate. Yeah. Already, electricity tariff is considered high now, right? And then when it goes up again, by 40%, that was why I was saying the other time, you know, some of us will have to start operating with lanterns and uh, torchlights, and cities may become villages because of huge cost. However, Ajero also made a point about insufficient service delivery, which is a point that is, you know, very uh, obvious, ep epileptic uh, power supply. But at the end of the day, you know, um, I think uh, organized labor is holding conversations with the federal government of Nigeria on the first subsidy issue. This is also an issue that they can table, you know, before the uh, federal government and also with uh, other stakeholders in the electricity sector. But if you talk to anybody within the electricity sector, they will say, well, one is a matter of uh, law, the multi-year tariff order, which you, you refer to, and that in any case, electricity cost must be cost, electricity tariff must be cost reflective. So maybe when we get to that point, some people will just decide not to have electricity. Uh, they, they go the village style. Yeah. Mm. Let me, I'll just say very quickly that um, the word on the street is, let us breathe. You know, this belt <laughs> tightening is almost seeming as if we're taking the actual breath out of the lungs of a lot of Nigerians because it is multiple shocks here mm. and there in terms of pulling off the rock. Nigeria, as we have now seen in the last few weeks, has been a highly subsidi subsidized um, government in terms of the interactions with the people. And then in three weeks, you want to pull off everything at once. It would be too much of a shock to the people. It has to be given in doses. You know what you often talk about with fire when you're trying to crash the high, I mean, high BP? High BP you yeah. do it in stages so as not to cause even more damage than 